Before I do begin, I want to take some time to thank the pastoral and pastoral staff for allowing me the privilege and opportunity to bring a message from the Lord today. Uh, but before I do continue, again, I want to say congratulations to our baptists or those who baptized at Gillette, Wyoming, Campery. I'm excited to see Sister Maddie Hand, the Hand family. Haven't seen Sister Maddie since the beginning of summer, so by God's grace, I thank God for the opportunity to see her now. Welcome indeed back to home, church. Um, congratulations to little man Benji. Uh, you weren't welcome when I first came, but now you are, and it's a privilege, so I thank God for that. Uh, for those online viewers, we thank you for watching today uh, at Hinsdale. Thank you for tuning in. It's always, again, a privilege and an honor, but if I may, if I may, as you know, last week, the Hinsdale Trailblazers, along with myself, had the opportunity to spend a week, again, in Gillette, Wyoming. However, there are a number of unsung heroes that were not mentioned in that week. Uh, here's a, just a brief list of those. We have Sister Jennifer, Sister Maribel, Brother Fernando, Elder Prohaska, Sister Reyes, uh, her sister, Sister Leticia, Sister Claudia, Sister Yavari, the Velasquez family, the Hand family, the Frederick family, and much more, the bus drivers, all those who stood up when chaos came, we say thank you. Truly, we do. However, I would do a disservice if I didn't acknowledge our Pathfinder director, Sister Heidi Prohaska. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. If I may, Sister, Sister Heidi Prohaska, who acted efficiently and then two reacted proficiently when things looked like they were falling apart. She held us together and showed us what it meant to truly be a pathfinder. So Sister Heidi, thank you. Church, if this doesn't displease you, I uh, wanna make a request, but before I do that, before I do that, I wanna bring your attention to a verse. In Nehemiah chapter 8, if I may, the prophet Ezra in front of the grand assembly of men and women was instructed to open the law of Moses and to read it. The Bible records this and if I may points out the human reaction from the assembly in their hearing of the word. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 5, it reads, Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. The request I'm about to make of you is not one from biblical command, but rather of respect and courtesy to the word of God. If you are capable, those watching online and here present, and the Lord has allowed you to be with us, if you wouldn't mind standing one more time for the reading of God's word. I appreciate it. It reads like this. Oh, thank you. It reads like this. And the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gold, gods of silver or gods of gold. Make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice it on it, your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an idol of stones for me, forgive me, sorry. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for you will defile it if you use your tool on it. Let's have a word of prayer. 
Dear God, we say thank you for your grace and again for your mercy. Yet as we approach the throne of grace, as we fix our hearts to you, bend your ear towards us. Let every moment of revelation in the mind be a moment of transformation in the heart to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, I invite you now for such a purpose as this, this we pray in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Before you sit down, shake the hand of the person next to you, tell them I'm glad you're alive, I'm glad you're alive. You may be seated, you may be seated. That's all right, that's all right, that's all right. While you're doing that, give God a hand clap of praise while you're doing that. Go on, give God a hand clap of praise while you're doing that. If God has been good to you, just give him a hand clap of praise if he's been good to you. That's all right, that's all right. That's all right. Church, the Israel, the infant nation, for the first 20 chapters of Exodus has the opportunity to experience actively the engaging and awe-inspiring power of God who unapologetically makes it known that he is God. And he, in this unapologetic nature, doesn't care who knows it. Rather, hmm? He would have you know it than to have you not know it. And then we see this unapologetic God present himself to Israel by way of Moses, raising the leader through miraculous signs, divine intervention, and with determination. He says to this group of people, I have not forgotten you. If you can remember, God foretells Abraham in what seems to be a deep sleep about the future of the infant nation and its growth. God shares with Abraham, the father of the young nation, the 400-year prophecy that Israel would be a group of people exiled and bent into the hands of slavery. (laughs) However, when it is their time to head into freedom, They will not leave empty-handed. Let me read it for you on the screen. Genesis 13. Forgive me, Genesis 15. Oh, forgive me. That's so embarrassing. So embarrassing. This message to the boys and girls. Boys and girls, forgive me. I even had it on my notes. I just forgot to read it. Boys and girls, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to do Children's Corner, and I wanted to, or Children's Church, and I wanted to before Camporee. So, if I may... On each one of the screens on my slides, you will see, just like you saw now, a letter or a number. Write that letter or number down, and it will decode a verse. After church, tell me that verse, and I'll, I'll get, uh, we'll see what happens next. But write that verse down, and make sure you read everything on the slides, and stay, pen, stay attention to the rest of the sermon. All right? Okay, now back to the sermon. Forgive me. Genesis 15, verse 13, it reads... Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that the 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Verse 14, but I will punish the nation that they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Again, like I said, let me reread it. If you can remember, God foretells Abraham in what seems to me a deep sleep about the future of the infant nation and its growth. God shares with Abraham, the father of the young nation, this 400-year prophecy that Israel would be a group of people exiled and bent into the hands of slavery. However, when it is their time to head into freedom, they will not leave empty-handed. We read this again in Exodus 12. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country. For otherwise, they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs and wrapped in clothing. If Before I continue, this verse in Exodus 12, verse 34 emphasizes the haste 
in which the Israelites had to leave Egypt. They did not have time to let their bread rise, reflecting, one scholar says, the urgency of their departure. This act symbolizes the swiftness, swiftness rather, of their liberation and the immediacy of God's sovereignty. The Israelites leaving with their dough in such a state also signifies their faith and trust in God. They had no time to prepare adequately for the journey, yet they trusted that God would provide for them. Church, I want to encourage you. If there was something to add to your prayer arsenal, hmm, it would be this prayer. But let me give you the disclaimer. This prayer hinges off the fact that you trust God with your situation. You would say, God, grant me the discernment to your sovereignty. Help me to be fragile to your Holy Spirit so that when my time comes, my turn of deliverance, my turn in marriage, my turn in children, my academic matriculation, my financial opportunity, my spiritual conviction, my faith development, when it presents itself to me, allow me to move forward with the readiness to do your will, to reflect your character, and to mature in any place you will have me. That's the prayer, church. That's something to keep in your arsenal. But let's continue reading in Exodus 12, verse 35. Forgive me. Exodus 12, verse, yes, indeed, 35. The Israelites said to Moses, instructed, ask the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. And read this. The Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people. And they gave them what they asked for, so they plundered the Egyptians. My goodness, church, there's a... God gave a promise to Abraham that his children, after slavery, would be seeing the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, including in this inclusion right here, the wealth and the support of their oppressors. God, in his faithfulness to Abraham, declares over Abraham's children his intentional attention to the restoration and liberation of this group of people. See, this is what happens, church, when you allow God to hold on to your life. You know, in your situation and circumstance, he will make the same people who had something to say about you in your season of transition, your season of grow where you're at, hmm? This season of restarting, rebuilding, relearning, when, when your car makes a funny noise in the driveway, when your job is dismissing you, when, and when the season of people talking bad about you, he'll make this same group of people be the first ones to see what God is doing in your situation, the miracle God has given to you in this life. This is what the God I serve. This is what he'll do. And so as we continue, Israel is now beginning to learn what it means to be chosen by God and called by him to do great things. He pulls them out of slavery, provides for them food they did not know of, and in their season of transition is not only their direction but to their protection in the land flowing of milk and honey. Yet now we see a shift in Exodus 20. There's a desire from God to be in a covenantal relationship with the growing nation and invites them to reach a higher ethical living as they draw closer to God. One scholar writes, Exodus 20 is a foundational chapter that defines the ethical, spiritual, and social dimensions of the Israelite community. It serves as a cornerstone for understanding God's covenant with his people, providing timeless principles that continue to shape religious thought and practice across various religions. This covenantal relationship is introduced by way of what is known to be the Ten Commandments. They are not only legal mandates, but also expressions of a deeper theological relationship between God, between God and humanity, emphasizing the call to live in accordance to his divine will and purpose. 
In addition to this Ten Commandments, God shares a dialogue in the mandates of an altar where the Israelites are to honor him in their sacrifice and in their worship. The altar is often seen as a place where heaven and earth meet. It serves as a tangible reminder that God dwells with his people and that they can approach him in worship and supplication. At the altar, it seems there is an atonement for sin. At the altar, substitution happens. At the altar, expression of devotion happens. At the altar, covenantal renewal happens and memorial of promises happens. At the altar, there is an invitation from God to God's people to not come blindly, but to offer your heart and mind to lay out before him your burdens and in return be given rest. And this all happens at the altar. However, God gives an interesting directive of how his children are to build this altar in verse 25. And he says, if you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for you will defile it if you use your tools on it. KJV and NKJV calls it unhewn stone. One scholar, when working with the text, recognizes that this directive is a warning, hmm? and it's meant for those to whom it was spoken to, that God's altar, here it is, is not to be shaped by your self-intelligence. What God is saying here is, do not attempt to chisel my altar using your wisdom to sculpt what you think is a comfortable relationship with me. Carving his will on your life to think what's best for your life. Rather, sculpt it and allow it to shape your life with its jagged edge. Church, if you will allow me to be candid, over the past few months, I've had the opportunity to teach and preach and touch the hem of the master's garment to you all, a message from him to you, and that is, one, God has not forgotten you. That was my first sermon. And then two, God is painting your picture. But at the end of my second sermon, I'm not stepping on no one's toes. I'm just saying, I'm just a messenger. That's what I'm saying now. Listen now. At the end of my second sermon, some individuals came to me with the question and slight frustration that I made a mistake by not showing you all the picture that was painted on my behalf. In my response, I jokingly replied, if you want to see the picture, invite me to preach again. Don't play with me. If you want me, come get me. Nevertheless, I am inclined not to show this picture to you all. Not because I'm hurt, but because in my estimation, what some of you missed and what many Christians miss is the tension of a failed expectation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There is a frustration birthed from the reality when you have more questions than answers. And you have to look into the unknown, not knowing anything, but rather God's faithfulness. The warning God gives in this estimation, in this directive, rather, to this group of people, is that they will be tempted to shape and trim the stone representing God's character and laws to their own liking. Is that my phone? That is my phone. I apologize. I thank you, Elder, looking out for me. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Nevertheless, nevertheless, like I said, I'm not trying to call anybody out. I'm not going to you to step on your toes, but if I happen to see what line you crossed, this is a moment of self-reflection. What God is trying to highlight with these group of people is that there is temptation for his children to think about their wants, their needs, their desires and cravings, and then cut the presence of God to fit that. Rather, what God is trying to say here is leave the altar alone, untouched, uncut, leave its jagged edge the way it is. The presence of God, let it shape your life, your thinking and behavior. One professor, when studying this text, 
when studying this text, says human wisdom delights to trim and arrange the doctrine of the cross until we can, feed it in, until we can fit it in a nice package, a nice system thinking that the gospel today needs to be updated and improved upon. And the truth is, church, that human wisdom is trying to carve the altar. I have two lessons here. I'm coming to verse 25. Two lessons. I'll be out of your hair. Well, during the benediction, I heard Brother Benji's stomach grumble. He said, Pastor George, don't be too long. I apologize. Two, two, two points, and I'll, be out, and I'll be out of here. Is that all right? Is that all right? Two points. Two points. One is this. One is this. The altar symbolizes God's will, word, and wants should never be overrun by your personal agenda and comfortability. The challenge is to accept God's presence and to absorb God's word without letting it be chiseled by the human heart and thinking mind of a church, a school, a relationship, a job, a committee who won't allow God to be God. Again, don't sit here thinking God is asking you to be ignorant when you come to him. Rather, God is saying, I want all of you, good and bad. The thinking mind, the, the precious heart, I want all of you not to be ignorant to your burdens and your situations and to your emotions. I want all of you to come to me and allow me to shape your situation. There's a dialogue that some of us believe be before we can approach God, whether in a church, in a prayer, or what have you, we have to fix our own things before we can come to him. God, God, before I come to church, let me stop smoking. Let me, let me stop fornicating. Let me stop drinking. Then I'll come to the throne of grace. You'll never come, church. Uh, personally, I had a friend I was supposed to invite when I moved here to my new apartment. I said, once I clean it, I'll, get you, I'll bring you over. He said, okay. Next week, he asked, when am I coming over? I said, let me clean it. I'll bring you over. Two weeks came, three weeks came. It's been six months. I, I have never invited him. I have, he hasn't stepped, he don't even know where I live. He doesn't even know I'm at Hensdale. Nevertheless, what am I trying to say? If you believe you can clean your bed, you, you, you made your bed, now you sleep in it. This is not the gospel. This isn't the gospel, church. There is an, inclin an invitation from God to God's people to come to the altar. Church, this moment, this time where we can come together and we approach the throne of grace, we pray, we get to sit, con uh, congregate with each other, is not to be taken in vain. This moment isn't for you to uh, try to, to stick God on your coworkers, huh? your, your teachers, uh, to, 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 to some people sitting next to you. When, you. when you come to church, when you are the church, there's an invitation by God, from God to you. It's to, to say, God, I, I need you in my life. I need you in my situation. I need you to teach me how to love, how to live, how to act. God, I'm hurt. God, I don't know what to do. God, bend your ear towards me. This all happens at the altar. This is what God is inviting you to do. However, what God is trying to warn you is to not falling into the temptation of pride and comfortability that creeps up on you as you draw closer to him. Your, your, presupp your presuppositions and comfortability and approaching the grand magnitude of God, listen, church, thwarts the opportunity of what God can do for you. That great Bishop Dr. Curtis when wrestling with the text, recognizes that divine rescue mandates changed behavior. That God's deliverance demands of those who have been delivered the necessity to have grasped a higher ethical standard of living. In other words, when, God's bring you, when God brings you out of a situation, you got to come out of it changed. Church, do not profane the stone. 
Another point this untouched stone is trying to teach us, and this might get me canceled. I'll take my whippings like a man, let me say it now. Church statistics show that this current generation is unfortunately one of the most biblical ignorant generations that we have. In this 24th century, one of the reasons for this unfortunate biblical ignorant generation seems to be the attraction of a watered down gospel. There seems to be an oversaturation of a gospel with no struggle. The tension of suffering and God seems to be one of the most taboo topics from the pulpit. Your tools, if not laid before the altar, won't allow you, listen to this now, walk through the doors God is opening for you. Sit in the chairs God is op- pulling out for you to sit in and shake the hands of people you thought you could never sit in. All because you think to get there, you got to go through a couple places that you're better than. All because you think, God, this, I don't deserve this. God, you want me to embarrass myself like this. That type of thinking sharpens the altar which then profanes the altar. If I had to paint a picture, if I had to paint a picture, there's a, my intelligence, church, is formed by accepting God's presence and therefore his word. And when wrestling with the altar and it's shaped in jagged edges, it then cuts me. The jagged edge, church, will cut you. I'm not saying it can, I'm saying it will cut you. However, this jagged edge, when it cuts you, these uncut stones and its sharp edges are intended not to hurt you, but to heal you and expose the dormant illness that laid inside of you. This is what happens when you allow the uncut altar to be what God is asking it to be. This, this uncut altar, if you will, will put you in a job where you have to learn integrity before you get into a career that demands it. This uncut altar, this jagged edge of what God is trying to do will put you in a season of heartbreak to learn that marriage only works through communication and patience. This jagged edge, church, will put you in a space of discipline because it, without it, and the God has all planned for you, will fall into the hands of another person. I prematurely clicked the slide, but that last point, not to have discipline with your tools and lay them before this uncut altar. We see this example in Samuel with King Saul and King David. It reads like this in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. Samuel is now talking to Saul and says, Saul, because you have tried to shape the will of God in your life, because of your pride and comfortability, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought another man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's commands. Church, there's a, if I could be candid one last time, there are some blessings I do not deserve, but was given, Hmm. not because I deserved it. There are some, let me say that one more time, there are some blessings that I am given, not because I deserved it, but because who it was intended for became too hard-headed for it. And so God blessed me with an opportunity because I laid at his altar and said, have your way with me, God. I approached the throne of grace and said, God, have your way with my life. My best ability is in my finances. Isn't isn't this nice ascot tie I'm putting on? 
or even this sermon, my best ability is my availability to God's will in my life. That's what it is, church. There are some blessings that will come into your life, not because you deserved it, but because who it was intended for became too hard-headed and didn't want to lean into what God was trying to do in their life. And so then, as this benediction begins to install, one will have to go through, here it is, church, a season of preparation for the purpose of longevity and preservation in their next season. This addition, then, demonstrates this, that the God who withholds nothing withholds nothing to the individual who withholds nothing from him. That's, what, that's it right there, church. And so here is another prayer to add to your arsenal. I'm almost done, I'm almost done. And this is this, God, if you are bestowing a benediction that was not intended for me, but is now in my possession because of my availability, and now you are beginning to extend my territory, please give me the provision and the reminder to bow my head in humility in front of you so that I can stand in front of everyone. And that's what it is right there, church. My second point, what God is trying to say is his presence in your life and all that comes with it is to be left in the shape of what it is. And when you encounter it, let it to be lived, shaped by you to be shaped by it and on the other way around. And, and here, God, here's the good news, church. If God gives this warning and directive about how his will, this altar, hmm, is not easy, this life-altering will call you to be uncomfortable, can't be added to or taken away, and might ask for you to live in some tension in all this God shares about his character and will, then know his promises, too, on your life cannot be thwarted by your self-intelligence. God's promises cannot be manipulated by any sharpened tool of self-intelligence you bring to him. Well, church, what God is trying to do is invite you and to allow your faith to be sharpened by the grand limitless power of Jesus Christ by way of living in a negative reality and not minimizing his promises. Let me rephrase it. God has eternal possibilities for everyone. What you have to do while living in your negative reality, praying in a positive possibility, is to not let your negative reality dominate the conversation. And here's the summarization of the whole sermon, right here in this one phrase. As you approach this jagged altar, the uncut stone, the unhewn stone known as Jesus Christ, your obedience to his will, promises, and possibilities for your life, despite the negative reality, you do not let what you do not see over one what can be. That's it right there, church. And that's it right there. Noah had to live in this tension while bidding the ark. Moses had to live in this tension before he put his staff in the water. And David had to live in this tension while slinging his slingshot. Each one of them lived in a reality that had negative circumstances, but hoped for the possibility that God is not done with them. They allowed this jagged edged altar, laid their tools down there and said, God, have your way with me. Sister Christian, let me come to the piano, please. I appreciate you. Church person, let me share with you about this jagged-edged altar as I come to a close. This jagged-edged altar last year, I approached it and said, God, I have your way with me. I bowed down in front of it, and it allowed a remote seminary student 
pursuing his MDiv, and in concentration with youth and young adult, the opportunity to do ministry in a church called Hinsdale. When I asked God, I said, God, where do I go? Where do I move? How will I live? What will I drive? He said, if you believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. Lean not on your own understanding. And then I met people like the Prohaskas, the, the Hans, the Schwartz, the Bedneys, the Dominguez, the Ivies, Elder Yovan, save me, appreciate you, Sister Christiani, the Kataramas, Sister Kathy, Brother Ron, Elder Bliss, Elder Botarenko, Elder Grosix, and their entire family, and little Sophie, little Benjamin. I got to meet a couple people who reassured me that whenever I fix my lips to him, he bends his ear towards me. Church, this altar is giving you the invitation today. That I know the plans I have for you, thus saith the Lord. I know your circumstances is grim. I know you got a lot going on, but I have a promise for you. There's a psalm, if I may. You know I like my psalms now. Psalm 114, the Bible says, when Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob from a people of a foreign tongue, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. There is a conversation where God took not just Jacob, but his entire descendants and treated them as his own family to do this will in his life. The extension is given to you as you approach this jagged edged altar. Let it shape you to be what he has for this life. Let God work in your situation. If I may, every head is bowed and every eyes is closed. There's an invitation today to someone who says, God, I, I want to give you all that I have. God, I don't know how to move forward. I'm stuck in a situation. I'm, I'm in a marriage that doesn't make sense. I'm at a school that doesn't make sense. I'm in a position that doesn't make sense. I got to do things and go places that don't make sense. God, have mercy on me. God, I'm stuck and I don't know what to do. There's an invitation today to let the altar cut you to see him in your circumstance. If that's you today, I invite you to stand with me and say, God, I, I lay my tools at the altar. God, I don't know how to move forward. God, have your way with my life. God, I, I, I'm stuck and I need you to shape my life the way you see fit. I cannot go back. I cannot leave this building and go back to the circumstance I have to deal with. God, I need you to work. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank God for an intentional time today. Master, bend your ear right now to the women and men standing, saying, have your way. God, if you can't be manipulated, neither can your promises. So God, I'm open to what you're doing in this life. God, I'm willing. Yeah, I'm a little scared, that's all right. I'm a little nervous, that's all right. But I know that you know the plans for my life, plans to prosper me and not to harm me. Pass me not, God. Lean into me. Lord, today there's a group of people saying this same prayer. Open doors for them. Bend your ear towards them. God, have mercy on them. We say thank you for this intentional time together. The same group of people, Lord, that you brought me to said they trust you to be in the driver's seat. They trust that you're painting their picture and that you have not forgotten them. That what you said will happen. And little by little, they wait for it because their present sufferings will not match the glory that is to be revealed in Jesus Christ. We say this prayer in Jesus' name.
Amen and amen.